A bank is robbed. There are no witnesses. Its president is missing without a trace. When a body surfaced, the criminal investigation grew deadly serious. Federal agents descended upon a small town that found itself gripped by fear. The small community of Nome, Missouri discovered their bank was robbed. They were shocked. When the bank president turned up missing, they were outraged. But things aren't always as they first appear. And when clues began to surface, the facts were more terrible than anyone could have guessed. I'm Jim Kallstrom, former head of the FBI's New York office. For federal agents, the Noel bank robbery became an intricate case in modern forensics and dogged determination. The Cowskin Bridge over Grand Lake, Oklahoma, just after 3 a.m. The lake is popular for fishing and boating. But on this night, it would be the scene of something far more sinister. A gruesome crime, meticulously planned and executed. A cold-blooded murder that would shatter the tranquility of the nearby town of Noel, Missouri. No! 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 Tucked away in the southwest corner of Missouri and home to about 1,200 residents, Noel is a community proud of its small town charms and low crime rate. On the morning of October 6th, 1989, Pauline Coonrod headed off to work at the State Bank of Noel. The cashier's first task upon arriving was to unlock the front doors. But Coonrod found the doors already open. She thought perhaps the bank president, Dan Short, had arrived early. But as she walked through the building, she saw no one. Within moments, Coonrod realized the vault had been robbed. Noel police and the McDonald County, Missouri Sheriff responded to Coonrod's 911 call. The FBI was also called in since the bank was insured by the FDIC, the Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation. An agent was sent to investigate from the nearby Joplin, Missouri office. The entire scene was meticulously photographed and dusted for prints. The agent noticed that the security camera had been spray painted and shot out. Spent casings found below the camera indicated that the robbers used a 45 caliber handgun. Investigators discovered that the thieves had made off with over $71,000, including 320 pounds of quarters, dimes, and nickels. We also keep some money here. Strangely, more than $100,000 in bills was left behind in an unlocked drawer. Bank President Dan Short was one of four bank employees with access to the vault and its time lock. Yet he was the only one of the four who hadn't arrived that morning. Questioning him became essential to the investigation. Bank Vice President Mark Allman told investigators that Short intended to work late the night before. 
the time lock on the vault um, hadn't been set the night that the robbery occurred. Um, Dan had came in was and was in the habit of working later in the evenings at different times during the week, but uh, um, that particular night he'd put it on standby uh, so that he could come back at a later time and, and open the vault manually. Agents wondered if Dan Short had in fact returned to the bank that evening. The sheriff drove to Short's house in Arkansas near the Missouri border. But no one was home and his red pickup truck was gone. Short's absence alarmed investigators. They couldn't help but wonder what role the banker played in the robbery. Within hours, word of the crime spread throughout the scandalized community. Knoll's a small town, main industries, poultry processing plants, some small shops, local merchants, um, quiet town, tourism in the summertime with the rivers, that sort of thing, but uh, basically just your average small town. Crimes like this did not happen here. Reports of the heist and the missing bank president filled Knoll news broadcasts. Investigators received many calls from the community offering help. One call from an employee at Sibley Manufacturing just outside of town gave investigators their first break. He reported a red pickup truck abandoned in the factory parking lot. The truck was registered to Dan Short. Investigators found coin wrappers strewn across the truck bed. The truck was dusted for fingerprints, but only shorts were identified. The discovery of the truck gave case agent and 19-year FBI veteran Liddell Farley a couple of scenarios to pursue. At the end of the first day, we weren't sure if we were dealing with, with an abducted banker or whether the banker, Mr. Short, had absconded with the money. Stops were being placed with his credit card. Airports were being canvassed. A rental car agencies were being checked to see if he perhaps had leased a car. But primarily, we're looking for his body, either alive or dead, in the immediate area of Noel. With Short still missing, investigators secured a search warrant for the bank president's house, hey, hoping to find something that would lead to his whereabouts. State police, anybody home? Mr. Short. Inside, all was quiet. Trooper, look here a minute. In the kitchen, they discovered an overturned trash can, suggesting perhaps a struggle. searched every room. Mike, come here a minute. By the bed, they found Short's glasses on the nightstand. He never went anywhere without them. Let's get some light on in here. Sir. Right. I think that's your it appeared that the banker had left in a hurry. Uh, I'd say he cleared. Yeah. Well, Still, it was impossible to determine from the search whether he had fled or was abducted. With no sign of short, agents canvassed his neighborhood, hoping for a lead. One neighbor, Carol Dryden, recalled seeing several vehicles pulling into Short's driveway the night of the robbery. Assistant U.S. Attorney Mike Jones was involved early in the investigation. According to Jones, Dryden's statement was critical. Around 2 o'clock in the morning, which really gave us the first time frame, uh, she saw lights uh, going into Dan Shard's property, headlights, and then about 15 or 20 minutes later, uh, going out of uh, Dan Shard's driveway. But the neighbor's statement didn't put the FBI any closer to finding Short. McDonald County Sheriff Don Schlesman was a lead investigator in the case and coordinated the massive search for the banker in the area surrounding Knoll. We set up a command post on the west side of Knoll. The groups were split up, giving roads to walk down. 
Highway Patrol had their helicopter down, we had our planes. Just mainly did a search from the air and ground. Beginning from the location where Short's truck was found, search teams proceeded outwards in concentric circles, hoping to find a trace of Short in the immediate vicinity. Five days after the crime, there was still no trace of the bank president. As the hunt expanded, Farley and 22 agents from the Kansas City office formed a task force with local law enforcement. To house the large number of personnel, the FBI set up headquarters of the local armory. While they unpacked, leads came pouring in from concerned residents. One tip came from local truck driver Buddy Mills. Having heard about the heist, Mills told an agent about what he saw on a road in Knoll the morning of the robbery. Returning home from work at about 3 a.m., he encountered three vehicles leaving town. One truck matched the description of Short's red pickup. It headed off with a two-tone van. The other dark-colored truck followed Mills for a while until it turned down a road toward neighboring Arkansas. This information jibed with Carol Dryden's recollection of the traffic outside of Short's house at 2 a.m. Mills' account reinforced the time frame for the crime. Farley met with the bank president's ex-wife, Joyce, who had been married to Short for 25 years. Although they had recently separated, Joyce stressed he was a loving father to their two children. Having worked closely with him at the bank for several years, she never witnessed any impropriety. Yet Short was the FBI's only suspect right now. And after several days of searching, he was still missing. On October 11th, a couple fishing in Grand Lake, just over the state line in Oklahoma, hunted for a good spot to drop a line. They motored to a favorite shady spot. Hoping to hook some bass, they sighted what looked like a clump of seaweed floating on the water. Moving closer, they made a gruesome discovery. Just under the surface, they saw the head and arms of a submerged body. Five days after the robbery of the State Bank of Knoll, Missouri, a dead body surfaced. Two employees of the marina towed it to a dock. The body was badly decomposed, but the coroner determined that the man had been dead for five days. Immediately after death, bacteria begin to break down the soft tissues of the organs, releasing gaseous compounds. After a few days, the gas fills the corpse and can lift the submerged body to the surface. Sheriff Don Schlesman recalled the bloated remains lifted additional weight from the bottom of the lake. He had the chain tied to him in a concrete block and part of a chair. And uh, it was a pretty gruesome sight, really. A corpse will float until the skin tears, releasing the gases. Then the body will sink back to the bottom. If the boaters hadn't seen the body that day, it may have never been found. The time of death was later determined to be consistent with the time frame of Dan Short's disappearance. The sheriff found a wallet in the victim's back pocket. Inside was a driver's license confirming the identity as Dan Short. The sheriff contacted the FBI. The search for 51-year-old Dan Short was over and a homicide investigation had begun. With his surfacing, which was almost in defiance of the people who had murdered him, it gave us the knowledge of what had happened and it gave us the focus that we needed in the investigation to direct resources thereafter. Farley and his partner Larry Nolan rushed to the lake to conduct their own review of the body. 
Special Agent Nolan's first task was to preserve the evidence. Collectively, the decision was made to release Mr. Short from the chair, at which time I uh, uh, released him and preserved the concrete block and the chain hoist, uh, the chair, and also the duct tape. Okay, guys. That's With Short's corpse freed from his death trap, the coroner removed the body. The medical examiner determined the probable cause of death was drowning. The chair with the block, chain hoist, and duct tape were examined and photographed by investigators before being sent to the FBI lab in Washington, D.C. The task force set up a hotline and published pictures of the chair to alert the public, hoping someone would come forward with information. It was clear from examining the chair and uh, the apparatus, so to speak, that was attached to it, and the location of Mr. Short's body, that he had died a horrible death. All indications are that he was conscious when he was dropped from the bridge some 30 feet to the water. The hotline was inundated with calls, helping build a file of more than 80 suspects. According to Sheriff Don Schlesman, one promising tip came from an anonymous caller who urged investigators to question two brothers, Joe and Shannon Agofsky. The Chicago Police Department dispatch received an anonymous call from someone that said the Agofskys had a lot of change in their possession, and a lot of change was what was taken from the bank. The FBI tracked down 23-year-old Joe Agofsky at a junkyard just south of Noel. The manager pointed agents to where yeah, Joe worked on his right? car. Yeah, sure. He's, uh, he's working right out there in that yard right there. Well, that's him right there in the black vest? Yeah. Okay, thank you. How are you doing? You Joe Ogowski? Yes, sir. Joe said that on the night of the robbery, he had been at his girlfriend's house, more than 40 miles from Noel. Is she available, and does she live locally here? Yes, sir. Okay, very good. Uh, we're also interested in uh, 45 handguns. He was cooperative and told them he had two 45 caliber handguns. Could, could we see it? The same could caliber as the weapon used to shoot out the security camera. They inquired if they could test fire the guns. Joe agreed and told investigators the weapons were stored at his home. His 18-year-old brother, Shannon, would be there to meet them. And your brothers, is this? Is when the agents arrived, Shannon Agofsky showed them where the guns were kept. Shannon told investigators that on the night of the murder, he was at his mother's house, where he was still living at the time of the crime. All right. All right. Um, it's going to be all right if we take these downtown. After firing both guns, agents sent the shell casings to the FBI lab. Examiners there would later determine that they did not match those found at the bank. To lead Agent Farley, it was a dead end. Both expressed their willingness to help the investigation if they could. Both had uh, alibis for the evening of the crime. Given these factors, our attention was directed elsewhere with other suspects uh, as both the Agofsky brothers appeared to be not involved in this crime. Back at Grand Lake in Oklahoma, where Short's body had been recovered two days earlier, resident Rowdy Foreman was out fishing with his son and daughter when he made a curious discovery along the shore. We came across a wooden dowel a brace, if you want to call it that, um, and it was just, it was just out of place. Alongside the chair part, Foreman also found a piece of duct tape. Having seen pictures in the newspaper, he believed it may have been from the chair found with Short's body. He sent his son to fetch plastic bags from his house in order to preserve his find. Sheriff Don Schlesman and a partner drove to Oklahoma to question Foreman about the discovery. And they asked me, said, do you have a piece of evidence? 
I told him, I, said, I don't know if it's evidence. I said, uh, I found a piece of duct tape. And his first comment was, oh my God, isn't that pretty? And they were looking at the fingerprint, just clear as day, there was a print there. The fingerprint appeared to be made from car grease, impervious to the lake water. But investigators still had to prove the tape was used in the crime. Although the tape contained fingerprints, that piece of evidence was not relevant unless it could be proven to be part of the chair or the apparatus in which Mr. Short was drowned. To prove that, FBI examiners would have to match the glue and strands from the torn piece of tape with the tape found on the chair. But that would take weeks. Until then, the FBI and local investigators still had no prime suspects for the crime. A week after the robbery of the State Bank of Knoll, Missouri, and the brutal murder of its president, Dan Short, the FBI had recovered Short's body, the murder device, and a possible fingerprint from a nearby lake. Investigators fielded calls from residents who were willing to help, but also afraid to do so. Due to the manner in which Mr. Short was killed, although the local citizens were very concerned and wanted to be helpful, some were reluctant to do so out of fear. Therefore, some of the witnesses did not come forth. They did so sometimes out of the insistence of a friend or an associate. Farley received one such call from a man who claimed his friend might have information about the chain hoist wrapped around the chair that drowned Dan Short. The friend's name was Wayne Boutain. Boutain owned a chain hoist which had recently been stolen. Though he notified the police, the hoist was never recovered. He suspected the Agofskis of stealing it. Farley showed Boutain the photos of the hoist investigators had retrieved from the lake. Boutain identified it as his own. He recognized damage on the pulley. He'd last seen the apparatus at Sheila Agofsky's house where he had once lived. Boutain agreed to take a polygraph test and passed it. Another important development in the case was the determination that the chain hoist, which was duct taped to the chair, was property of Wayne Boutain, who had left it at the residence of Sheila Gofsky a few days before the murder of Mr. Short. On the strength of Boutain's statement, Farley decided to question the Agofskis again. Driving up to their mother's house, he noticed an old van in the front yard. It closely matched the description of one of the vehicles Buddy Mills saw the night of the bank heist. Farley questioned Sheila about the missing chain hoist, but she claimed to have no memory of it. She also corroborated Shannon's alibi, saying he was at her house the night of the murder. I don't know anything about it. I have no idea. Okay. I can't help you with anything. I appreciate your time. We'll be back in Farley left with suspicions that she knew more than she was telling. He asked the brothers to give their fingerprints, hoping to match the one found on the duct tape. Joe Agofsky complied. When asked about the hoist, he told Farley he remembered seeing it at his mother's house. Yet he didn't know what became of it. A few days later, Farley returned to Sheila Agofsky's. I'm special agent Farley. 
There he found Shannon with a friend by the name of Gant Sanders. Having secured Joe's fingerprints, Farley tried to convince Shannon to give his as well. Set of his fingerprints. It'd make things a lot easier, possibly get you out of some trouble. Joe Gowski was very cooperative and produced his fingerprints uh, upon request without hesitation, while Shannon was evasive and hasn't to. Gant Sanders watched cautiously. Shannon echoed his mother's story, proclaiming he had no knowledge of the chain hoist. He eventually promised Farley he'd come down to the police station to give his prints, but he never showed. Although Farley had initially dismissed the Agovskis as suspects, he took note that Shannon and Joe's memories of the chain hoist were conflicting. Now, he decided to take a closer look into their background. Researching the family's financial records, Farley discovered that nine years earlier, they had received money from an insurance settlement after their father died in a plane crash. Popular opinion was that their money was still plentiful, making them unlikely candidates for bank robbers. But Farley learned that wasn't so. While they had all received a considerable sum of money, as of that time, Joe had spent his. Their mother had spent a large portion of hers. And Shannon Nagoski had a considerable amount of money still in a fund, but it was not available to him at that time until he was 21. Agents found that both brothers had recently purchased cars with cash, yet neither had jobs. Investigators also determined that 18-year-old Shannon had spent more than $5,000 since the heist. Although the Agofsky brothers' spending looked suspicious, Farley still had no solid evidence linking them to the bank robbery and murder. Revisiting crime reports and witness statements, he made a new connection. Truck driver Buddy Mills said he had seen three vehicles leaving Noel on the night of the robbery. That meant there was a possible third suspect out there. If two of the vehicles were driven by the Agofsky brothers, then perhaps the other was driven by one of their friends. Farley recalled the young man he met briefly on the Agofsky's porch the day he questioned Shannon, Gant Sanders. Sanders had recently become Shannon's roommate. Farley tracked him down at a junkyard. The closest associate that we could identify of both Shannon and Joe Agofsky was Gant Sanders. It was learned that Gant had been good friends with both Joe and Shannon, both prior to and after the robbery and murder. But Sanders said he knew nothing about the robbery and murder, although he offered no alibi for the night in question. Farley decided to question Shannon again, this time with a polygraph machine. A couple of things about the test is nothing will be painful. The test was administered in a motel room by a technician from the Missouri capital of Springfield. A polygraph is used by investigators as a tool to rule out possible suspects. The machine monitors the subject's reactions to stress in three ways. Tubes fastened around the chest monitor the slightest change in respiration. Low voltage electrodes placed on the finger detect moisture on the skin. All right, relax your arms and a cuff on the arm measures changes in blood pressure. The examination is based on the body's fight or flight principle. When the brain perceives a physical or psychological threat, the body responds by increasing blood pressure, heart rate, and respiration. Shannon Nagofsky was asked about Dan Short, the robbery, and the murder. Did you take a chain hoist from Wayne Butane's? No. Did you kill Dan Short? No. 
Based on his physiological responses, the examiner determined that the younger Rogofsky brother was deceptive about his knowledge of the crime. It was clear to Farley that Shannon was somehow involved. But he'd need more convincing evidence to bring charges. In December 1989, the Agofskis were subpoenaed to appear before a grand jury to answer questions under oath. Each family member gave testimony separately. Shannon, Joe, and Sheila each disavowed any knowledge of the bank robbery and the murder of Dan Short. After questioning, Shannon was once again asked to supply his fingerprints voluntarily. Again, he agreed and set an appointment. In Washington, D.C., FBI analysts continued to examine the items sent to them by the agents in Knoll, trying to match the chair part and tape retrieved by Foreman to the chair and tape that had been bound to Dan Short. An examiner confirmed that the wood found by Rowdy Foreman was part of the same chair that Dan Short was taped to. The piece of tape with the fingerprint on it was the most promising piece of evidence. But did it match the tape used on the chair and body? It did. Examiners were conclusively able to link these portions of tape by matching the torn ends, the fibers, and the glue. The tape found by Foreman had two complete prints on it. They compared the prints to Joe Agofsky's, but they did not match. Farley recalled this finding was not all bad news. The fingerprint examiner notified me that the prints on the tape were similar to that of Joe Agofsky, but not identical. And he advised me that the fingerprints of siblings were often similar in pattern. Therefore, the getting the fingerprints of Shannon Agofsky was imperative. Although he told the grand jury he would provide his fingerprints, Shannon never did. But this time, Farley would force Shannon to comply by serving him with a subpoena. Grudgingly, Shannon Agofsky gave his prints to the FBI almost five months after the heist and murder. Since comparing his prints to those found on the tape would take several weeks, Shannon was free to go. But Agent Farley did not remain idle. He knew that Gant Sanders was close to both brothers and probably knew more about the crime than he had said. So he decided to confront him. He told Sanders that if he was innocent and had knowledge of the crime, he should cooperate with the investigation. But if Sanders was knowingly protecting the Rogofskys and they were convicted of the robbery and murder, Sanders would be jailed for aiding and abetting. Worse, without a solid alibi, he was still under suspicion of the crime. But Sanders revealed nothing. He remained faithful to the brothers. Farley thought that perhaps Sanders was hiding his guilt with his silence. Agent Farley pursued two brothers, Joe and Shannon Agofsky, as the prime suspects in the bank heist Hello. and murder. Joe's fingerprints had been compared to the me. two found on the duct tape from the murder device. His did not match. As investigators waited for results on a comparison with Shannon's, additional partial prints were discovered on the tape. Now the FBI needed new prints from Shannon, a 360 degree view to match the partial prints on the duct tape. But Shannon was nowhere to be found. Farley hoped that he could get to Shannon through one of the Agofsky brothers' friends, Gant Sanders. The agent also suspected Sanders could be the unidentified accomplice. But cooperating with the FBI would mean betraying his longtime friends. 
Finally, in June of 1990, hoping to clear his name, he contacted Farley, wanting to talk. Investigators told Sanders they thought that he had helped commit the bank robbery and murder in Knoll with the Agofsky brothers. But Sanders claimed he had nothing to do with the crime. However, he did admit to his involvement in another more recent incident. On one particular evening in late December 1989, Shannon and Joe Agofsky broke into a house in Missouri and stole several rifles. The brothers rendezvoused with Sanders later that evening, setting the second part of their plan into action. The next day, Sanders and Shannon drove across the state line into Arkansas and sold the guns. It was a federal violation. Sanders recalled another time when the brothers tried to convince him to participate in another, more violent crime just months after Dan Short's murder. Sheriff Don Schlesman recalled how the Agofskys tried to recruit Sanders. And they told him, hey, we're, uh, we're not doing any more Mickey Mouse stuff. We're, uh, we're going to go hit a place, and there's probably going to be some shooting because they got armed guards. And if you don't really want to kill somebody, you'd probably better let us know so we can take you back home. And so uh, Gant told him he didn't really think he wanted to be involved in something like that, so they turned around and did take him home. By cooperating with the FBI, Sanders made a deal for his role in the illegal sale of the firearms and was put on probation. He was also finally dismissed as a third suspect in the bank robbery, passing a lie detector test three times. With the help of Sanders' statement, Farley issued a federal warrant for Shannon Agofsky. He was indicted for transporting and selling firearms across state lines. Since Joe had not been involved in the sale, he was not charged. Authorities tracked down Shannon in a small town in Arkansas several months later. When apprehended, police searched his vehicle and found several bags of nickels in his trunk. Shannon was turned over to authorities in Missouri and booked in the Springfield Federal Courthouse. Look at me. While being processed, Farley acquired the set of Shannon's fingerprints examiners had been waiting for. The FBI lab needed a front and back view of his prints, hoping to match two partial prints found on the duct tape used in the murder of Dan Short. But his older brother, Joe, was still free, and Farley had little evidence to tie him to the crimes. Investigators knew the brothers remained in contact while Shannon was behind bars. Since all prison conversations were recorded, agents got a glimpse into the Agofsky's family relationship. Shannon made a number of calls to his mother and Joe. According to Assistant U.S. Attorney Mike Jones, one call was particularly incriminating. Uh, Shannon was asking Joe if uh, we would be able to make a case against him, and, and Joe indicated that we would not be able to put him uh, uh, at the scene. Farley knew the brothers were worried. But the call was not enough to arrest Joe. Then, just days later, he finally received the results from the lab. Those fingerprints turn out to be the fingerprints of Shannon Nagofsky. The tape was determined to have come from the chair in which Mr. Short was bound to. Therefore, that piece of tape became a most important piece of evidence in this case. Mike Jones now had a strong case against Shannon. We knew we were going to prosecute Shannon once we got those first two fingerprints, and then the main focus was on Joe trying to uh, get a case built against Joe. How's it going? Finding evidence against Joe was a thorny task. Nothing directly linked him to the crime. Once again, Farley combed through financial records to see how much Joe had spent. We attempted to determine all his cash transactions and did determine that he had spent some $19,000 in cash during the 16 months following the robbery. During that time, he was unemployed. 
and had no logical explanation for having that much cash. Scrutinizing Joe's phone records, Farley made another important find. Right at. Joe had made several long distance calls to his girlfriend at her home during the very days leading up to and after the robbery. Yeah. The calls destroyed his alibi. Joe had stated that he was staying with her the entire time. Not too smart. They called Sanders in for additional questioning, hoping he could shed more light on Joe's involvement. Sanders told the agents about a conversation he had with both the Goffsky brothers. That incident took place in Sammy Skaggs' junkyard. The three of them were working on one of the cars, and uh, Sammy Skaggs announced that uh, the banker from Joplin was here to pick up his car. And that apparently generated a, a comment from, uh, I believe it was Joe, that uh, what the three of them ought to do was to uh, follow a banker, follow him home, uh, grab him, kidnap him, and force him to take him to the bank and open the vault. At the time, Sanders agreed that it might be an easy way to get rich. The plan sounded eerily like what could have happened to Dan Short. It was now clear to the FBI that the brothers had the knowledge, motive, and opportunity to pull off the homicide and heist. Based on accumulating evidence, Joe Ogofsky was arrested more than two years after the horrifying crime. Both brothers were indicted on three federal counts relating to the bank robbery and murder. But would the evidence be strong enough to convict the two brothers? The investigators were betting on it. Almost three years after a bank heist and brutal murder, FBI agent Liddell Farley handed prosecutors all the evidence the task force had amassed. Reviewing their files, the agents described the Agofsky's plans and actions to Assistant U.S. Attorney Mike Jones and his associates. They were determined to prove beyond any doubt that the brothers had committed the crime. The FBI had learned that Joe Agofsky, needing information about the state bank's floor plan, had opened a safe deposit box a few weeks before the crime. Bank Vice President Mark Ullman told investigators that Joe was particularly interested in Dan Short as well. He made a point of asking who Short was and where he lived. He's our president. Would you like to meet him? Oh, no, thanks. I was just asking who he was. Returning home, Joe drew floor plans to the bank and plotted the crime with Shannon. They decided to do the job before the sun rose so there would be no witnesses. So we'll get through the front door. When we get through there, I want you guys to knock the cameras out. To get into the vault, they needed someone who had the keys and knew the combination. For that, they would abduct Dan Short, the bank president, and force him to open the vault. Afterwards, they needed to make sure he'd never talk. They thought it would be easy money. Life would be good with their new fortunes. Get these guns clean. In the early hours of October 6th, Joe and Shannon Agofsky put their plan into motion. Acting as a lookout for them was an unidentified accomplice who drove the blue Chevy pickup. It was the same vehicle neighbor Carol Dryden recalled seeing around Short's house a week before the kidnapping. The brothers loaded their mother's brown and tan van with the equipment they would need to commit the crime. At around 2 a.m., they arrived at Dan Short's house, a brief trip across the Arkansas border. Eventually, he awoke from a deep sleep. Intruders would be the last people he ever saw. Short tried to flee. 
but he had no chance against the brothers and their accomplice. They threatened to kill him unless he turned over his keys to the bank. Silencing him, the intruders dragged Short outside. The terror continued as Short was stuffed into the front seat of the van. Each criminal drove one of the vehicles, including Short's red pickup as they sped off for the bank. Agent Farley and the prosecutors continued piecing together the events of October 6th. The Agofskys and their accomplice pulled up to the bank, only a brief drive from Short's house. With their captive in tow, the robbers quickly opened the bank's front door and ran in. No alarm sounded because Short had neglected to set them, and no one would ever be able to see what was about to happen. After ripping the duct tape off his mouth, they pulled Short over to his desk and retrieved the keys to the safe. Then they forced him to provide the vault's combination. Once inside, they grabbed all that was in reach. Get him out! Get out! Get out. And dashed away. Go! I'm going to head off. Move it! They dumped the loot in the truck. Afraid for his life, Short complied with their every demand. But the assailants pistol whipped him and knocked him out. On the way out of Noah, Buddy Mills crossed paths with the brothers. After he passed the intersection, the three vehicles sped off, the first two heading toward Grand Lake. Reaching Grand Lake, some 22 miles from Noel, the two remaining vehicles stopped along the high point of the Kowskin Bridge. Here, Shannon and the unknown accomplice prepared to kill Short by drowning him. In his haste, Shannon took off his gloves to secure a portion of the tape. Shut up! And unknowingly stop. left greasy okay. fingerprints behind. Then the two attached the stolen I'm chain hoist. I'll do anything. Anything you want. When they finished, they lifted short above the lake. Oh, no! No! And plunged him into the black water below. At the first trial in September 1992, the evidence was strong enough to persuade a jury to convict Shannon and Joe Agofsky of three federal crimes relating to the robbery, abduction, and use of firearms during the illegal acts. In the state trial, only Shannon was found guilty of murder. Though the unidentified accomplice was never found, it was determined that the Agofsky brothers were the masterminds and principal perpetrators of the crime. No charges were brought against their mother, Sheila. Without doubt, this was the most difficult investigation I've been involved in as an FBI agent. Some 29 years of investigating various crimes. This was a, an unusually heinous crime. Today, Joe and Shannon Agofsky are serving life sentences with no chance of parole. For his cooperation, Gant Sanders served the remainder of his firearms charge on probation. Noel has returned to Norman, a violent chapter in its history now closed. Yet because of the crimes of these blood brothers, it will never be the same quiet, innocent place it once was. <laughs>